you know, a CRM member selling this will say to you, um, what do we do? What do we do today? Forget, forget Congress for a minute because nothing's going to happen immediately with, with Congress. What does a brand do today that's selling NMM and has been advised now by FDA, um, indirectly at least, this has been authorized as an investigation as a drug you can't sell lawfully as a dietary supplement. What's, what's the counsel that you guys are providing? Sure. And, and I have to always be very clear. The lawyer always has stipulations, but I, you know, CRN can't provide specific legal advice. Uh, we can talk about generally what we see as the risks uh, for moving forward, for not moving forward. Um, and, and we can, you know, especially for CRN members, we, we can recommend legal counsel in this space that are well-versed in, 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 risks and how to provide the best advice for a specific company moving forward. Um, I think there's some considerations companies need to keep in mind with regard to NMM versus NAC. With NAC, companies did continue to sell uh, that ingredient despite the 2020 FDA warning letters. Warning letters are not final agency action. That was one of the challenges and the points that we pushed back with FDA after they issued those warning letters in 2020. Uh, the, as, as far as I was aware, FDA was not specifically notifying companies about the sale of NAC. Here, they may move forward with that. Um, in, in their objection letters from November 4th, they noted that they would be telling companies that had submitted uh, NDINs um, about their determination. Uh, so, I, you know, I do think companies need to take into account any risk if they've been you know, notified directly, had correspondence directly from FDA with regard to selling this ingredient. Uh, and right now, I think those that have, you know, been on the receiving end of these objections, industry itself, trade associations are still figuring out the best course forward. Uh, and, and I think we're likely to see challenges. Um, and so once we start to see challenges, I think that will help companies make determinations as to this is an ongoing conversation with FDA and continue to sell the product. Um, I, I think right now companies are probably still figuring out exactly what to do. And, and I think that there doesn't appear to be any immediate sense that FDA is going to require companies to start pulling products. Um, so companies really, really should be talking with their own legal counsel about these various risks uh, and, and how they could continue to sell the product moving forward and what, what penalties could be on the table for selling it. But I do think there are parallels to NAC. Only time will tell. We'll probably see in the next couple of weeks to months what and who might challenge where FDA would go with this ingredient. Um, that said, you know, NAC, FDA moved forward with enforcement discretion after conversations with industry. And I think at that time it was appropriate for companies to continue to sell NNC because it was an ongoing debate with FDA. Uh, and, and, you know, I think one of the things here that, you know, CRN, other trade associations might decide is the right path is to push FDA to also exercise enforcement discretion and consider a rulemaking. They have that authority. They've already exercised it for NNC, at least with enforcement discretion. And, it, you know, I think that's something that the FDA could do in good faith to show that they are taking into account public health. And, and, and I think we need to note here, too, this is a similar to NAC. NAC was allowed to be sold for decades without issue question by FDA. FDA issued a non-objection letter to an NDIN and let companies move forward with selling this ingredient. It wasn't decades, but, you know, the agency itself noted that they weren't aware of the connection with this MIB ingredient and NMM. They're not disclosing the uh, preclusion date, the, author is the IND authorization date. And so, you know, how can you expect companies to be able to rely on information from FDA and rely on public information if FDA itself isn't even getting these dates correct? I appreciate that. I, I, th I think I just wanted to, uh, you know, mention that FDA advised me in an email that um, they did inform all the companies that had submitted NDINs um, of its determination that this ingredient is excluded from the definition of a dietary supplement. So over a handful of companies have submitted NDINs to FDA. On this ingredient, FDA has advised them directly. I asked them, are they, do they plan to reach out to Amazon or any brick and mortar retailers? And um, essentially, uh, it was a no comment, and that was yesterday from the from the agency. Um, I want to push back a little bit, Megan, on the you know the enforcement discretion. NAC have been on the market, like you said, for decades. This ingredient has only been on the market in recent years, and we also have a a a, a drug company, Metro International Biotech. I imagine they would push back 
on enforcement discretion because they would want they they have an interest in creating a uh, a monopoly on this ingredient. Um, your thoughts on, on any other strategies uh, from industry from the side of industry to challenge this determination? Hey, uh, Megan. Of enforcement discretion. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, can I can I jump in on this because this is yeah, a much ahead. bigger this is a much bigger picture than any one ingredient. Uh, I think Megan aptly points out there are a lot of parallels between what's happening with NMN and what happened with NAC. There are also a lot of differences uh, between those ingredients as well as what happened with CBD. But but what is it they all have in common? It's this drug preclusion provision which creates ambiguity. Uh, as to how it should be interpreted. And it is being used, uh, you know, in numerous cases to now give drug companies monopolies over ingredients that arguably should be in the, uh, uh, the supplement space to give consumers access to these ingredients that we're not making disease claims for. We're making legitimate structure function claims that these can help to prevent wellness. So, I, I think there's a, a much bigger issue here that's going to lead us to really peel back the drug preclusion provision and ask what needs to be done to fix this. That will take the involvement of Congress. FDA is not going to change the statute on its own. But all of these issues keep pointing to the fact that we have a problem as the research keeps getting better and we know more about these ingredients and we have drug companies then that pop up and say, well, I studied it first, I should get a monopoly over it. Uh, I, I do think it's a difficult situation for the companies who are already in the market, but they were misled in May when the uh, earlier uh, NDI notification uh, was responded to and FDA said, we have no problem. Likewise, they had been uh, misled for years when these previous NDI notifications on NMN went in and FDA might have objected on the fact that, uh, well, you don't have enough safety data, you didn't appropriately uh, explain how you're going to make it, but the FDA had been silent in those previous notification responses as to any issue as to whether it's a dietary ingredient. It seems like that was an a priori issue FDA should have addressed right up front. If they didn't think it was a dietary ingredient, they should have said so. So, so you have this example where FDA leads companies to believe it's acceptable and then pulls the rug out from under them. That's why we need to fix the statute. And Thanks, Steve, Steve. if I can just add, because I think I think part of this is the interpretation of article. It's very, very broad. What is actually the article that's the drug and the supplement? I don't have enough information about NMM right now to understand the differences between the supplement and, and what's being studied as a drug. But with NAC and CBD, these are completely different products. NAC was inhalable, approved as a drug. It's a, ingestible as a supplement. CBD, Epidiolex is incredibly high doses of a very isolated form. Companies have tried to, to work with FDA to understand that CBD found in hemp extract works in a very different manner. And so I think that's one area that companies could explore is, is really, you know, if there are significant differences, which I suspect there are in the, the doses, the, the way it's being used, that obviously the claims that we could make, um, that needs to be, I think, brought to, to FDA's attention. And, and it, it's, a, it's a public health argument. And it's an argument that gets Congress interested because they, they look at this and they say, why can't these ingredients coexist? It just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense that you're stopping, you know, it's a very specialized way in which it's it's manufactured and formulated for drug use and yet you're stopping it in in lower doses and other forms for consumers to just buy at their local drugstore so i i, I do think that that resonates if, even if it's not you know getting us moving the needle with the precedent set by fda it does i think get congressional attention 